Happy week to you folks. This is Matt Powell with the Prom Mech Podcast. Glad to have you back. This is actually an official podcast. You can tune in to our news feed and check it out on the website, or you can go over to iTunes and download the podcast. We finally made it official. We have an actual podcast. I want to take a minute to thank a couple of people that made this happen, primarily the guys over at Talking Lead. They helped me develop this, get all the equipment correct and set up properly. And so we are able to actually get out there and put the message to a much larger audience. As I said previously, we had a lot of downloads on the audio lectures and a ton of listens on the Blog Talk Radio days, so it was time to take this and move it into an actual direction. One of the things that I wanted to do is is that I wanted to take my small bit of celebrity and the people that I know and be able to bring them on and ask them the questions that I wanted to ask, be able to... Just ask those questions that I'm always thinking about when I'm talking to somebody that's a great trainer, a great martial artist, a great health and fitness coach, a great shooter, or somebody that just has an immense amount of knowledge that you wouldn't be able to get by themselves for an hour and actually sit down and be able to talk to. And so if you ever have any questions, you can definitely go on to the Promac Podcast Facebook. Of course, you can go over to promac.com and you will see the facelift that we've done on the website. It looks amazing. And so you'll always be able to get the latest podcast over there or on iTunes, like I mentioned, or subscribe to our RSS news feed. Or you can jump on that podcast Facebook and see the videos that we're talking about, see who we have coming up. Um, We don't expect a ton of likes out of it. Facebook seems to be changing a lot of their analytics and the way that they're doing a lot of things. So it tends to make it a little bit more difficult to use Facebook to reach a massive amount of people. But we can use it as a source of information so that you know what is going on week to week with the Promac podcast. Now, just like anybody else, I like to look at videos every now and then on YouTube or different websites. And... I always enjoy looking at the more comical videos that are out there because they kind of give me a sense of what's happening and I can get some laughs off of it. One of the things that people know about me is is that I really don't watch a lot of people's instructional videos or martial art videos or anything like that. I like to live in a little bit of a bubble when we develop things for Promac. But that doesn't stop me from scrolling through Facebook or looking at things that are kind of funny when I'm surfing the web. And this week, one of the funny ones that I found was this video that we've posted over at the Facebook, facebook.com slash podcast. Video proves that EFO martial art is complete bullcrap. So what you're looking at is you're looking at a guy that teaches empty force. And empty force is what people call chi or psychic energy or whatever they may call it. And it's the idea that you can knock somebody down or fight them with never touching them. The video is actually quite humorous because you have an instructor who, I'm I'm not sure, I haven't done a lot of research into who he is. I don't want to call him out by name because nobody deserves to be publicly humiliated unless it's on video. I'm not going to pile on to it. But this guy, um, he, he appears to be American, and he has gone to what appears to be a European martial arts school, and he's decided he's going to teach EFO. He starts off with his students, and he's doing things, and they're falling down, and they're, they're all over the place, and he's making his psychic energy chi EFO attacks on them. And then all of a sudden, the other students, they're filming it, and they've, they've got some you know subtitles in there that they're going to start challenging him. And so they start getting up and they start challenging him. And then the excuses start flowing. Now, one of the interesting things about this video is that this guy is obviously an experienced martial artist. A lot of the things that he is doing, he could actually probably make work if it was not empty force and it was actual force, maybe an AFO martial art. If he was using actual mechanical force on these people, some of these things would lead him to be able to direct them into the direction that he wants them to go and to do things. But instead, he's relying on EFO. And it turns into a complete you-know-what show. Excuses are flying, the guys are punching at him, 
and he's trying to move him around, and then he's telling him to relax. You just need to relax a little bit more, perhaps open yourself up a little bit to what he's teaching, and these guys are basically trolling him right in his face. It's one of the funniest things I've seen in a while. Definitely go and check out the video. Leave some comments about your thoughts on it. I know what your comments are going to be, that it's all BS. But one of the things I wanted to talk about is that this video is not complete bullcrap. Because there's really two types of EFO. There is the mystical, I'm going to use my psychic energy and chi in order to knock you down. And then you have the EFO, which is actually a manipulation of the flinch response in the body. It's something that I do often. I'll close with somebody and then I'll, I, I won't say I will, I know exactly what their cone, their peripheral cone from their eyes is. So I may kick at their leg in order to elicit a response. You may move your hand quickly towards one side of their body in order to get them to go to another side of the body. It is a feint. It is a basic manipulation of the, the flinch response that we have so that we can position the person to do what we want to do. So when you watch this video, you have to recognize the difference between the two. Here's a guy that is trying to move somebody around with this empty force that apparently he has picked up at some point in his martial art career, and he's got a lot of students, and they've created this echo chamber. And that echo chamber is, it's working on you, it's working on you, we're going to continue doing it, we're going to put it out on YouTube, we're going to put it out to the public, we're going to get that small niche of the market that really believes in this stuff and they're going to begin following what we do and they're going to come to our courses and they're going to learn to do it. It's one of the most rampant things of BS in the martial art community, unfortunately, is that people think that they can do this. In reality, it's been proven time and time again that it cannot be done. So go ahead and check it out, look at it, and then think about the difference between a feint and manipulating a flinch response and using your psychic energy in order to knock somebody down. Now, a lot of you are familiar with the audio lectures and the way that we've done things in the past, which is basically me talking for an hour and giving a lecture and talking about what's new with Promac, but we're going to do things a little bit differently. I am very fortunate this week to have Sarah Jameson on. Sarah is somebody that I have a high amount of admiration for with her work. She's not a, I'm going to read it in a book and go out and teach it. She reads it in a book. She really absorbs what the subject matter is. And it's incredible subject matter you're going to hear her talk about. And then she goes out into the world and she does it. She experiences. Even in her own life and her past and growing up to the officers and the military personnel and the students that she deals with on a day-to-day -day basis, she has a very unique way of looking at how do we train people. And she breaks down some things, and one of the things I want to encourage you to do as you listen to this interview is make sure that you have your rewind button ready to go. Scroll back a little bit, pick something up, think about it, go out and research it. Hit her on her Twitter account that she'll talk about. Or go on the Facebook.com slash Promac Podcast and ask some questions about it. This, this is one of those interviews that I've wanted to do for a while. And after the interview, I'll actually get into the audio lecture portion of the podcast. But it's one of the interviews that I've wanted to do a while because I've known Sarah for a while. We've worked on some different projects together. She wrote for ConquerYourself.com. She's been a contributor to MSF. She helps me focus some of the things in Promec that sometimes I tend to forget. And she brings that focus in with the things that she teaches that I can look at what she's teaching when it comes to PTSD and movement and movement mechanics and dysfunctional movement and I can look at those things and relate it back to the CLM in order to get a little bit more of a defined path in how I'm going to deal with a student. Now after the interview we're going to have the audio lecture part and then we're going to go ahead and talk about what's going to be on next week's show. So let's take a music break real quick, come back and jump right into it. I lend an equal ear to each and I suffer no complaints When the fuel is pure, I'll 
pictures and the shadows be your guide. The best way out of hell is through the So I'm fortunate enough to be talking to Sarah Jameson. Sarah's a renaissance woman, I guess you could say. I met her through John Wolf and the folks over at Wolf Fitness Systems, and she has an incredible story. She's the founder of Run for Cause, a TEDx speaker, tactical strength and conditioning specialist, and Sarah, you can probably fill us in a little bit better than I can. Um, just <laughs> tell everybody, you know, what you do, who you are, and that way people can kind of get to know you a little bit. Yeah, for sure, definitely. Well, first of all, thanks for having me on. Uh, great opportunity and always awesome to connect with you. Um, yeah, basically, you know, my, my whole shtick in life is kind of twofold. The first is, you know, what I do in my day job is, is working with, um, you know, athletes, uh, you know, patients and clients in chronic pain. I do a lot of work, as you mentioned, with, uh, with tactical response, police officers, military and fire. Um, you know, my, my whole kind of shtick is, is basically just to provide industry leading tools and education in both, you know, the two pillars of movement and recovery, which of course we can, we can get into, um, you know, over the course of the interview, um, which is usually about recovery and, uh, corrective strategies, inter, integrative, evidence-based movement, cognitive science, and looking at kind of the, the mind-body connection. Um, Run for a Cause is also another uh, passion of mine. Uh, it's a 10-year passion project that uh, I started in my 20s, so I'm going to date myself here. Um, and I'm in my last year of this 10-year uh, project. My goal kind of setting out was, you know, I want to be able to use my sport, in which I love, which is running, as a means to giving back uh, to the community in some form. And so I started combining my, my running and my racing uh, with different organizations and causes that really kind of spoke to me and resonated with me. Um, and three of those pillars over the last 10 years has really been at-risk youth, uh, mental health, mental, mental illness, as well as um, w uh, women and girls leadership, uh, specifically combating the effects as well as the, the stigma around uh, domestic and, and uh, child abuse. So you, you, had a, you had a run today, didn't you? Sure did. Yep, today is uh, is Run for Mom. It's an annual run that I do uh, every year. This is the, the third year that we've we've done it. Um, and it's really about uh, honoring my mom, who passed uh, on July 31st, uh, 2008. She battled uh, bipolar disease for close to uh, 15 years. And um, unfortunately, with that concurrently, um, addiction to alcohol and, and pain medication. Um, and unfortunately, we lost her to uh, to suicide. So it's something that um, I'm extremely passionate about. And this run is is really to honor her memory, so that you know the identity of a person should not uh, be it's associated with a disease. It's not who she was. She was a very strong woman and beautiful woman. And so the, this run today was really not only about honoring her, but honoring all the women and the resiliency behind women who have struggled with significant life challenges like abuse, um, you know, violence, uh, mental illness, and for us to really kind of stand together and, and break that silence and break the stigma. So we had uh, 40 people out and about all over North America as well as Europe doing a virtual run that um, was powered by Fit Cause, an organization that uh, Run for Cause uh, partnered with last year. And it's great. It's an online uh, tool where you can use uh, wearable technology to track your fitness activity, and then that fitness activity contributes to not only donations, um, but uh, also just to showcase how many steps and miles everyone is, is taking as part of this community. So it was it was a really great great run, um, and it's my first run from post surgery. So it's uh, it's great to be able to get back out there and, and sweat a little. So you've you've run fifty thousand miles. Yeah, the equivalent of uh, about equivalent of the globe twice in the last ten years. You're, it's you're, you're uh, like I'm a bit gone. of a nerd, so I like to kind of clock steps and reps and you know all that stuff. And so ten years ago when I started, I had a pedometer and. I've been kind of, you know, obviously there's times when I haven't haven't worn it and forgotten it, but it's pretty much been about that 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 amount that you're amount almost, of steps. You're almost like a tactical Force Gump. <laughs> Force Gump with a it looks a lot better and has like kettlebells or club. Oh my god, that's like awesome! That. Yeah, well, you know, he was in the military. There you, there you go. <laughs> For a short period. What is yeah? What is the worst? Everybody always says, what's the best advice you can give somebody for running? What's the worst advice? Like, what's the worst advice you can give somebody who's going to start running? The worst advice? Um, oh, God. I'm, that's, this is so funny. I've never been asked that question. I'm usually asked what, what good advice to give. Worst advice would probably be to not run, honestly. 
running is running is awesome. Running is amazing for the body. It's amazing for the soul. It's you know it's the first thing that uh, we we did as bipedal humans. You know we're meant to run. We're meant to have that locomotion. Um, I could go on for hours about it, but the worst advice. Yeah, I could say like, why wouldn't you want to run? So there's nothing equipment-wise or race-wise or anything like. No, the worst it's advice really... would be don't make a marathon your first race and start prepping two days before. You know what I mean? Well, like, no, those that that things. could be. Oh yeah, yeah. That I mean, definitely preparation is key. If you don't if you don't prepare, then you 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 know the the likelihood of you achieving success is going to be pretty slim. But with that being said, is you'd be surprised. Um, advice is really unique to each individual. Um, I've I've worked with clients who have trained for si- minimum six weeks and they've gone straight into ultra running. Now these are people that have been athletes in the past, but um, you'd be surprised how much when you really want something the human spirit can prevail. Um, yeah. <laughs> Through- through you with that a little bit, sorry. Yeah, I'm like, wow, I've never been asked that question before. I like it. That I mean, everybody always, what's the best advice you can give somebody that's just starting to run? And it's like, well, everybody knows that. Like, I want to know what don't, what should I not do? Like, what's the one thing, you know, don't do this. What's the worst advice, you know, you could give somebody? Like, you know, everybody always wants the best advice. I, I want to make sure I know, like, what to avoid more than <laughs> oh, I- what to do. That's easy. <laughs> I mean, when somebody's run 50,000 miles, I don't I don't know if I've walked 50,000 miles in my life. Um, <laughs> I have to figure they probably know some ins and outs. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It's um, it's um, It's been a long haul. Like, and, and when I say I've walked, like, you know, 50,000 miles. I mean, there's been, there's been lots of injuries involved in that. Um, you know, I had, uh, I was at adrenal fatigue for, for a year, um, which kind of, uh, put a wrench in some of my running. Um, you know, most of those miles over the course of the last three years has been done, you know, commuting to and from work, which is, which has been great. Um, it's been, it's been a really interesting journey. I've had a lot of, uh, a lot of ups and downs and, you know, much like life's unpredictability, we always have to grow and adapt and evolve. Um, but you know, through that, I've I've been given such great opportunities to meet thousands of people, um, connect with organizations and causes that are doing such integral work to not only local communities but global communities. And you know, the our, the culture in our world has changed, um, and it's really important for us, especially with the connectivity that we have with uh, you know with Skype and with Facebook and you know. Um, FaceTime and all these things, it's important to also get together uh, in person and to do these types of, of, of projects and these types of events. Now, you actually, speaking of evolving, and you you mentioned a word or a phrase the other day that I was not familiar with, the, the biopsychosocial <clears throat> you know, model. model? <laughs> yeah. I, and yeah. I had never really, we were talking on the phone, and I had never really heard of that, and started looking into it and I think I know a lot of people haven't heard of that can you can you explain that a little bit more what what it is yeah yeah of course um, it's interesting that the, the bio, biopsychosocial model has um, kind of come out of uh, the clinical so the clinical and kind of health medical field um, you know was was Sigmund Freud you know started this kind of revolutionary concept in the 1900s and Basically, what it is, is it's a health-first model, and it focuses on uh, the intersecting matrix of uh, biological, which is, you know, cellular function, biomechanics, um, biochemical or neurochemical, uh, psychological, which entails, like, thoughts, emotions, behaviors, and then the social aspect, which is, um, you know, our environment, our cultural factors, things along these lines, um, you know, even our age and gender and, and, you know, who we surround ourselves with. And from that, it's it's really kind of showing the contrast of how all three of these spheres have to work in balance um, in order for us to really kind of um, meet that that the health and wellness that we want to have. And and these spheres kind of change based on what it is we're doing, stresses in our lives, and so on and so forth. Um, and so the when you know working with with chronic pain. Uh, is something I've been doing for over 10 years with with both athletes and clients and and whatnot. Um, and I realized that this played an influential part in both athletic development um, as well as just 
overall health. So, you know, for instance, with, with, with tactical officers, obviously the, the stress factor being a huge part of, of the job, um, is, you know, a, a big kind of component and focus of, of where I, uh, the, the research and, and, and whatnot that I do. So the bio, biopsychosocial model is really taking those three contexts and making sure that you have coping strategies and everything is in equilibrium and balance so that you're not like training too much or, you know, when there are stresses or when there are times of anxiety, you make sure you have coping strategies for that. And, you know, one of the most important things with the social aspect is making sure that you have a good support system, um, you know, whether it be family and friends or an outlet from which you can you can make sure you're not isolating yourself. Okay, so let's actually take, so you talk about an officer and chronic mm-hmm. pain with an officer. And, um, you know, we have a lot of different types of people that listen to this podcast, especially from the law enforcement community, the military community, martial art, fitness. It's pretty wide ranging, but I think the officer is an interesting rabbit hole that we can go into a little bit with the biological, psychological, and social side of it, because when you're, I mean, if you're pushing a car eight <laughs> hours a day, and then, you know, you have those type, I mean, officers, we're, we're famous for sciatica, and mm-hmm. having problems with that from our duty gear, and then, of course, you know, any type of job-related injuries at the time that don't get taken care of like they should. So um, how does that model apply to an officer? No, that's actually a great question. Um, well, if we kind of look at it from the, the very kind of foundation, um, you know, the nature of police work in general um, obviously has a, has a high level of stress producing situations. Um, and no one is immune to stress or emotional strain on the job. Uh, the physical aspect of, you know, the, 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 the duty gear that you have to wear, the vest, all of these things restrict a lot of, um, movement in the body. So if, if you're wearing a vest and your duty gear for, you know, 10 to 12 hours, most shifts are 12 hours, um, that's a lot of restriction on the thorax. You're in a patrol car for, like you mentioned, you know, eight hours, eight to 10 hours of that, uh, depending on, you know, um, whether or not that's the department you're working in. Um, a lot of that, the physical ramifications of just the actual equipment and the the PPE, is uh, is it plays quite a long, like a deep role in in the physical changes that your body has. So if, if we look at the biopsychosocial model, the first entry point that that I have with with um, clients and officers is the the obviously the biological because I look at the biomechanics. You know, my first uh, you know. Um, screening process is to look at, you know, we base it on neural development, so how we develop from babies and into adults. But we look at, you know, the seven key movement patterns that a human does, and we look for deficiencies and dysfunction within those patterns. You know, and that that can relate to either tissue extensibility, so muscle that needs to maybe be rolled out or stretched, or joint dysfunction as well, so the inability to mobilize certain joints. And so we see, like, thoracic spine, lower back, um, pain and injuries in officers due to just the, the status of their job and what they have to do day to day. With that, then can trigger anxiety in the body. So the, the actual neurochemistry and biochemical secretions in your body change. Cortisol goes up, adrenaline can go up, immune system goes down, adrenal function goes down. And so we see, you know, sleep disorders when, with, um, you know, shift work as well, which is then concurrently reproduced with, you know, the limitations from the the biomechanics. Um, that was one of the most interesting things that I, when you mentioned how the shift work. Mm-hmm. I mean, most people think of you know, uh, you know, it, it, you become a day sleeper, or you know, you deal with a different type of criminal at night than you do in the day, or your shift changes. But the actual biology and psychology and the social side of the shift work, I never thought of it like you talk about how shift work actually affects an officer. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's and it, it, it does because the you know when we sleep, when we get restorative sleep, and there's a difference between restorative and 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 regular sleep. Most sleep is disruptive. Most people either have a hard time falling asleep or have a hard time uh, staying asleep. Or with shift work, it changes your biological clock as well. So your your actual uh, chemistry and and you know neurological components all shift. Sometimes people adapt a lot quicker. Other people have a real hard time adapting to it. Um, and so when we don't have restorative sleep, things change and manifest differently in our body. A lot of the things uh, that tend to happen are, you know, people are more prone to injury. There's more risk there because their their motor skills are reduced. 
Um, they're not able to, you know, react the same way. Um, you know, tripping over a curb when you're trying to run down a suspect is, is you know, things like that where nor- in normal circumstances that shouldn't be a problem, but when people lack sleep or um, when their body's starting to break down, it changes. Movement's a behavior, and a behavior is in the brain. So when we talk about movement, that's motor control. That's your brain telling your tissue to do something, your joints to do something. And when that response is diminished or doesn't um, doesn't work as well as it should, then things in the body start to change. And with restorative sleep, that's really our time, your body's time to filter everything that you've processed throughout the day, every visual stimulus, every auditory stimulus, every kinesthetic or tactical or tactile stimulus, all of that has to be filtered and filed away into, you know, into our gray matter of our brain. And with restorative sleep, everything else in your body shuts down. But if you don't get that, then things start to change. And how your body represents that is is through stiff and tight muscles, uh, injuries, Um, you know, just feeling kind of overall not so great. Psychologically, it can be, you know, higher response to fight or flight or alertness, um, kind of on edge, mood changes, all these types of things. And, you know, then that, when we start talking about, you know, the, we've done the biological and the, and the, and the, um, uh, psychological component, then we look at the social context of that. And that's really looking at the support system versus isolation. Right. So the culture of first responders, you know, whether it be law, military, fire is, you know, you got a buddy system. And a lot of people that are on the job also hang out, you know, outside the job because all of the similar interests. But sometimes we don't actually talk about the things that, you know, goes on at the job. So having that support system is, is hugely important. Um, and that all factors down to, you know, those three spheres having to work in association with each other and finding that, you know, that, that uh, equilibrium between all three. You know, it's interesting because one of the things that we talk about with um, the concept behind mission-specific fitness is that you, it's like a pie. Mm -hmm. And, you know, with that pie, you you have your diet, you have your exercise, you have your theory, understanding why you're doing something, and then you have the social aspect. Because, you know, when when you have people around you that are doing that, you can have that competitiveness or you can have that, you know, support network, you go to the gym, you have somebody to work out with, that I think the social side, a lot of people don't put the emphasis on it that it actually needs when it comes to long-term health, long-term fitness, that that is an important area, not just going to the gym by yourself all the time, but working it more into the social side of the things that you do, which is why I think CrossFit has been so popular, Mm -hmm. is that there's a... It's, you're not going down to the LA Fitness and pumping iron for 40 minutes and wiping off a sweaty bench every now and then. I mean, you're you're in a group social environment. Mm-hmm. And I think that's one of the things that you know we 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 forget way too often and turn fitness into a solitary pursuit. Yeah, yeah, and it's and it's interesting, and even in in the sense of. Um, you know, the physical training of, of, of um, what the officer needs to do to not only, if you're just the, starting out as a recruit, maybe just applying to a department, um, but also as a vet within the department, it's, you know, the, the training has to be specific for what it is you're doing. And so a lot of the, the officers that I work with are coming from, and CrossFit is, is a great, great sport. I absolutely love it. I, I do it myself. Um, but when there's movement dysfunction or injury um, components, when there's risk, then we can see that you know there can be there can be a heightened amount of of injuries coming out of that. So it's really important for for individuals that you know are training hard to understand that you have to train for what it is that you do. Those patterns have to be transferable uh, into your job and your profession. And CrossFit's great because it you know it elicits you know power and strength development. There's a lot of agility. You know it's 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 metabolic training at the highest. It's 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 functional. Um, and a lot, but a lot of the work that I do is in people that have already been injured or there's, pre, there's precursors like low back or sciatica. So what to do when you actually have an injury that could be prevented, um, is really a large focus of, of the physical side of things that I do. And it's, it's an amazing, amazing, um, niche to work in. Now tell us, tell us a little bit about that, what you do. It, it's funny when you get into these, everybody in the, martial art or fitness or shooting community and so forth. Everybody's got their day job. Um, Mm -hmm. 
And a lot of us are fortunate enough to have day jobs like I do that transfer into the other things that I do as my, my interest and my hobbies. What, what's, the, what's your day job? And Because it feeds directly into this. Yeah, yeah, it does. My um, my day job is something I've been doing for 15 years in the health and wellness industry, and cor- basically corrective exercise is really the, the foundation of what it is that I do. But um, if we look at kind of what is corrective movement or what is corrective exercise, the reality is that the, in order for the body to, to really function properly, there has to be cohesiveness, cohesiveness between the muscles, the joints, and the neuromuscular system, so the nervous system in general. Uh, so we look at training movement and then – you know, look at it from, from the, the fundamentals that actually create movement. Um, you know, a problem with, with many exercise professionals that, that we're faced with today is that the active individual has kind of lost their ability to do the basic fundamental movements. And that's, you know, whether that be, uh, you know, squatting, lunging, stepping, reaching, you know, they've become less efficient due to habits or poor training or injuries or their profession. Uh, causes postural deviations, prime, you know, prime movers versus stabilizers become less effective. Um, you know, so these are the things that I look at. I get to screen biomechanics and then, and then really kind of look at creating innovative and, and integrative ways of, of, of fixing that so that we re- can restore movement quality and we kind of, kind of rebuild those connections. Um, you know, in our industry, what we, that's called matter, uh, movement pattern recognition, which is basically getting the brain to talk to the tissues more efficiently. Um, and that's really what I do all day long. And, you know, it's funny because most people go, oh, so that must be rehabilitation. Well, actually, it's not rehabilitation. My goal is to not actually rehab people. My goal is to is to look at the human frame and find dysfunction before it becomes an injury so that people can 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 work out and train and live optimally versus having to have an injury and then rehab. And when we look at the medical system in general, and this, you know, this this goes into whether it be, um, you know, our training, you know, uh, personal training or coaching athletes or GPs, um, all of the fields are really based on treatment versus prevention. And one of the things that, you know, that I'm trying to do is, is change that paradigm so that we look at prevention versus always treatment. And so that's, that's really a big part of it. And, and the recovery aspect of that is, is, you know, more of the, the, what I call the mind science or the cognitive science part is it's not just about recovering the physical body. It's about recovering from stress. So what goes on in the brain at the, you know, the neurological and biochemical levels and, you know, how can we coach people to, to take it down a notch so that when they do need to recover, they can adapt and be stronger individuals because of it. So let's get more. All right. You, you just said something that's perfect because I wanted to kind of take it down from the 30,000 foot view to the 5,000 foot view, mm-hmm. you know, down to the deck of your martial art instructor, not you, the royal you, mm-hmm. whoever. Mm-hmm. What are some things that somebody like that can do in their class to create good movement habits? And, you know, look at that type of stuff you said, you know, coaching people to take it down a notch. How, you know, how can you teach somebody to identify that type of thing and their students and know when to back off it? What are, you know, what are some things that, if you had to pick two or three things that a martial art instructor or, a, you know, a fitness, I'm, I'm not, I mean, we're going to talk a lot about fitness, but um, the martial arts side or, you know, those types of things that people can look at and go, okay, here's some things that I can do to make sure that I'm not creating a, you know, a dysfunctional movement patterns or whatever you may say, you know, mm-hmm. to have, to walk into class with the right attitude to get the best movement out of the student and make sure they're not creating bad movement habits. For sure. Awesome question. Um, the first, the first kind of component I'd say is, is, um, work in patterns, not parts. So there's a difference between, you know, like doing a chest press or a lap pull down or push ups or sit ups. Like these are, a lot of these are parts, not patterns. The great thing about martial arts is it's all patterns. It's all patterns. But what we do tend to see in martial artists is a lot of over flexibility and not enough joint stability. So, whether it be martial arts or a CrossFit class or a, you know, a boot camp class, any of these things, most of the time, um, the average pop person that's going to walk in there is going to have, a, you know, an issue with the low back to a certain degree. And not, I don't mean back pain, but lumbo pelvic control. 
So how does your trunk and your ability to activate and engage your your trunk stabilizers, your transverse abdominals, which is the inner unit that stabilizes your spine, in association with your trunk and your pelvis? Because that is going to relate to any type of lunging, jumping, squatting, anything along those lines. Um, it's interesting that you you talk about you know flexibility versus st- you know joint stability. Yes, that two I think, different things. I think a lot of times when we when we look out there, especially at YouTube, or you see somebody doing something new, and then everybody kind of has to outdo them. So if somebody has you know a wide range of motion in their shoulder, and so the next person has to put a kettlebell in there and try to have a kettlebell in something that is a range of motion exercise. And there's this giant confusion as to what the purpose was and what you're trying to do. It's one of the things that always kind of drives me crazy when I see that outdo the other person when it comes to movement by throwing weight into that movement pattern. Oh, yeah, yeah. And, and the reality is, is that you you need to be able to load your body without anything. And, and even standing up, like walking is two times your body weight, running is eight times your body weight. So even to, to stand and squat... Or, you know, you need to be able to do that with your body weight before you actually load the structure. What, when loading with whatever tool you, you choose to, to, to bear, whether it be barbell, kettlebell, club bell, whatever. Um, but yeah, it is an interesting thing because a, a lot of the times, um, you know, when clients ask like, oh, I've, I've got a mobility issue, I must need to stretch. Well, actually, no. Mobility isn't just tissue. There, mobility or mo- mobility dysfunction needs to be broken down into either a tissue extensibility dysfunction, which is shortened shortened muscle. So, for instance, hamstring. Um, you know, everyone is trying to stretch their hamstrings and put their foot behind their head, and the, the human body needs 70 degrees of hip flexion, and that's it. Anything over is, is a bonus. So if somebody has res- actual length in their tissue needs, is shortened, then they need to stretch, and that's, that's, that's a muscle issue. That's, that's tissue. But with the joint... Uh, that's a whole other ballgame. We're talking, you know, laxity of a joint, you know, the range of motion, you know, end range of and how that associates with with other joints. So, for instance, you mentioned, you know, a, like a kettlebell press, a push press. So for the shoulder, we have a lot of I see a lot of clients with shoulder injuries that actually aren't shoulder injuries. They're a lack of thoracic spine mobility. If you can't move your spine, your shoulders are going to have to take on and compensate for that. So. You know, in, in let's say a, a class where, you know, you are going to be doing loading exercises, ensuring that the spine moves appropriately, there's multi-segmental movement, the hips, if you're going to stretch the hip flexors, make sure you stretch the glutes, you know, make sure you mobilize, not just stretch, which is, which is different. Um, mobilization, and you know, also encourages stability of the joint, not just mobility of it. So it's really understanding the difference between mobility versus stability, patterns versus parts, and really making sure that that's well balanced within a class format. So hold, hold on, I'm taking my foot from over my head. It's Excellent, good it, job. I had it stretched <laughs> over. Um, <laughs> oh, that, that hurts. Um, all right, I'm, I'm really curious. I like this pattern is not parts thing. Mm-hmm. I'm, can you deep dive that a little bit more? Can you Can you tell us a little bit more? Because I think that's one of the things that an instructor can walk in and view that Mm -hmm. and kind of know the difference between the two and then do something about it. Can you, can you explain the patterns, not parts a little bit more? Yeah, of course you can. Um, so when we think of, when we think of a part of a body, um, so traditional strength conditioning, you know, um, or personal training, we, when, you know, when, when we look at the human anatomy and physiology, we think of the chest, right? The back, the quads, the hamstrings, the glutes, uh, whatever muscle group, biceps, triceps. And we then choose exercises to facilitate, you know, whatever it is we're focusing on, strength, endurance, power. So whether it be a, a bench press or a lat pull down, those are parts. Those are exercises for parts. The problem is, is that, and of course, it depends on, you know, what your goals are. If you're going to bodybuilding, awesome. Then that's, you want to be training parts because that is what you're going to need to, to be able to execute that sport efficiently. But in martial arts or in, in tactical training, you know, the most sports are in part, or sorry, are in patterns. So the human body doesn't work in parts. We work in patterns. If I want to walk forward, there is a series of muscle activations and joint uh, mobilizations that need to be, that need to take place in order for me to get from A to B. And these are things that are genetically encoded in our DNA. The baby 
was never taught how to fire its core. The baby was not t- taught how to crawl or walk. It's, it's something we learn and to do through experience. Um, <clears throat> so in a class format, ensuring that you're, that, that you're looking at the patterns, not just the parts of human movement. So proper lunging, squatting, uh, reaching, um, you know, uh, trunk stabilization. All of these things need to be part of a well balanced, well executed, comprehensive program. Um, does that make? I mean, a I meet sense? a lot of people. They they've got the parts. Yeah. They have put them in I a mean, pattern. Yeah, put them in a pattern, and they can't they can't stabilize. And and yep. it, I mean, they they come in. They're they're. I mean, officers or whoever it is come in. They're they're incredibly strong, mm-hmm. and no range of motion. And injury prone all day long outside of the part. If it's something that they're not used to lifting in, you know, their one to two dimensional way, they're going to get hurt. Yeah, yeah, and it's you know when we when when you look at movement in general, and as I mentioned before, movement's a behavior. So a behavior takes place in the brain. If you want to change movement, you have to change behavior. So. I can go out there and I can, you know, squat 325, I can bench my own weight, all these things, but, you know, at the end of the day, if I can't do something like when I fall over, if I'm taking down a suspect, I need to be able to maneuver and manipulate that person. That's a pattern. Those are patterns that we're training to so that you can execute something efficiently. You can't get that out of just doing a bench press or a squat or a max deadlift. Those are all great for power and they will they will play a role, but there's a difference between prime movers and stabilizers. If you can't stabilize at some point in time, that will blow. It's like putting the, the wrong fuel in the car. Your car will drive, but it will break down at some point in time. Now we're going to give our voices a little bit of a break, and we will be right back. Okay, and we are back with Sarah Jamison. One of the things that you mentioned a few minutes ago was corrective attitude, and I mm-hmm. I, I like that. And you're you're very big into empowerment, personal empowerment, um, women's issues, and so forth. How do you see this type of stuff relate to empowering women? If that makes sense. Um, yeah, no, no, it totally does. Two loves that you have, and you know how how can these types of things create a stronger, more empowered woman? Yeah, no, that that's actually an awesome question. Um, you know, the, a lot of the women that um, you know that I work with, both professionally but also personally in, in my causes, are are most often women that have been through trauma of some sort. And trauma doesn't doesn't mean it has to happen to you. You can witness trauma. Um, or witness an event that that deeply shapes and shifts the shifts the paradigm of who you are and who you're going to become. So when we talk about empowering, you know, women in general, we, you know, it's been a really interesting, I w- interesting last 50 years. You know, after women getting the vote and you know women uh, going through the feminist movement, and I can go down the rabbit hole with that, but I won't. Um, women in general, still to this day, wait a minute, w- women can vote. Yep. No, I'm just kidding. Okay. Who knew? I know, right? Um, <laughs> I'm just joking. That's quite all right. Um, yeah, and it's 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 interesting because you know women today are are we're in we're in a very interesting position because we want to be professional leaders and we also want to have families, and so women in general are go 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 go. They're you know we're trying to spearhead our own companies. We're trying to work as many hours as we can to provide for our families and to also leave a legacy. And so there's you know there's this is a kind of like a two pronged way that we can look at it. And the the first is you know what I just mentioned is more societal, and then the other one is more kind of uh, you know personal of of where women have kind of come from. When I talk about movement and corrective movement, you know I have. Uh, a lot of clients and and when in my life that you know it brings them self confidence it brings them the ability to 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 look at leadership skills and personal development skills within a a healthy atmosphere you know and and you know the the type of corrective movement or movement um, 
skills development that I uh, focus on, uh, you know, are it can be in the gym. So, you know, having a, a woman who has previously been um, abused, uh, whether that be domestic or, or sexual or whatnot, and getting her into a position where she feels confident and strong to go back out into the world. You know, so when when I talk about empowering women from what I do with Run for a Cause and, and how, you know, my profession is being, you know, a, a, a health and wellness leader, that to me is is the most important thing, is, is giving women the skills so that they can go out into the world and, you know, be inspired and be motivated and also feel uh, that they're strong enough to to be out there and uh, to defend themselves if necessary and to put themselves into positions where they're not isolating themselves. They're, they, they're out there with their community and their friends and their family. Um, now, you do, a, you do a lot of work with PTSD. And, yes, yeah. Yeah. Um, with that, my- that's got to be a gigantic thing from, you know, abuse. Like you said, I mean, you don't, it doesn't, you can just see it. You don't have to do something, you know. You can you can get that P, the. I totally lost my thought right there. I'll edit <laughs> okay. it. Um, hold on. Let me go back. But okay, so you work a lot with PTSD, and I I see a a, a real line being drawn between the PTSD side of things and women, especially you know women who have been abused. And the movement side of that, one of the things that, you know, you you told me, you know, is that, you know, pain is movement. And, you know, there's a lot of things in there that people don't see when it comes to PTSD that yeah. can, you know, really injure movement. But, you know, you can get over a lot of things using the movement. What, what role does, you know, movement and pain and PTSD, all those things coming together? It's almost like, you know, the parts and patterns thing. Mm-hmm, you yeah. got a couple of parts over here, but they're creating a pattern. How do you, how do you view that pattern? Yeah, that's, that's an awesome question. Um, you know, and, and, and PTSD is, an, is, is, I'll answer that in just one second, but PTSD is an interesting diagnosis. Um, you know, a lot of the times, you know, depression, anxiety, uh, mood changes, all of these things kind of are, you know, there's a synergy there. One kind of leads to the other. Sometimes they go back and forth. So PTSD is an, is an interesting disorder to uh, to look at, and it's actually more prevalent than most people realize. Um, you know, when we look at when we look at the brain, trauma reshapes the brain. So we'll start with that. Um, pain, whether it be physical or mental, changes movement, and your your body doesn't recognize, your brain doesn't recognize whether stress or anxiety or pain is mental or physical. Like neuropathy and the neurological connection there is is the same. If I feel pain, I don't know. If your your brain literally doesn't know if it's if it's mental or physical, but it's there. So when we look at um, mental illness or mental health, which is you know a large part of the work that I do, that I volunteer in, and research that I, I look at, is really understanding when there is physical pain, there's usually a mental component of that, and it's the chicken or the egg, which came first. Right. If I have anxiety and stress in my body, my tissue will respond to that because our tissue holds an emotional context. It's the psychosomatic connection. So my tissue will tell me, I'm unhappy right now. You need to change something or you need to change something in your life because this, what, what you're doing right now is not working for you. And that anxiety and that, that the pain will get so high in individuals where something will blow, whether that be a diagnosis of you know, whether it be PTSD or depression or uh, anxiety or an injury like low back pain or sciatica, things along these lines. Um, so the bo- they, both of them go hand in hand. Um, so when we look at that, that in, in its essence is a pattern. Movement in general releases stress. It, it you know, it releases the, the serotonin and dopamine and all the chemicals at, that neurologically we need to heal the body and restore movement and res- restore how we feel. So, you know, active living and staying active are all part of that. So my role when I'm working with individuals that if there's, you know, there's, there's uh, a mental illness um, diagnosis or maybe it's they're feeling a little, you know, humans get sad, humans get angry. That's part of, part of who we are. 
Um, but when I can clear the body of dysfunction by using, you know, corrective exercise tools, maybe it's yoga, whatever I feel that unique individual needs, it's an amazing thing what happens. If you can rid the body of dysfunction, the mind and the mental component usually gets better as well. And it, and that can go either way. When someone who does have PTSD gets the support they need, whether that be, you know, professional support or maybe it's self-regulation, they, they've developed good coping strategies, um, you know, whatever, whatever that is, then we see the body start to clear up as well and also uh, start to move better. And it's, it's really kind of looking at, that's why um, when we look at, you know, movement in general or, you know, the biopsychosocial model, all three of those spheres have to work together. You, you can't you can't have one or the other. It's it's not how we work. Our brain and our body are not separate. We're a whole system. It blows my mind when you when you see the interconnectivity to all of this. I mean, the, there's so many ramifications for training because of PTSD. Yeah. And I mean, PTSD doesn't have to be oh I was in Iraq and something happened. It can be. A, a way that you've been treated in a really bad martial arts school. Mm -hmm. Yep. You know, it can be an injury from a fitness place, you know, some fitness program that, you know, a traumatic injury, you know, those types of things, they have so many ramifications that I, I think a lot of times instructors, people come in, they do the checklist, they teach the class, boom, get out the door. <laughs> Mm -hmm. And they don't they don't take the time to look at those types of things. It's one of the things that we talk about um, with Promac and the CLM. And book three was the teacher and student relationship, is peeling back that onion, mm -hmm. and getting as back you know far back as you can. Um, because if you in in combatives and in self defense situations, you know time at you you need more time. It's either you know time to you know, defend yourself and stop what's happening or time to go on the attack or whatever it may be. And PTSD and emotional intelligence and so forth, especially in women, the interesting thing about it is is that if you really want to prepare somebody, um, especially women, for self-defense, you really have to get back almost to the first time that their dad ever spanked them. You have to go that far back because they're going to draw a relationship between what is happening to them. It To really like prepare people, you have to get that far back into what's happened to them before they ever showed up on your doorstep. And yes. be able to work through those things to really get somebody able to deal with the situation that's in front of them. And, you know, it's, it's one of those things that the more I read into it, and, you know, that's that's one of the reasons that I wanted to have you on here is that you know you don't just you you didn't just sit in a room read a bunch of books and then go out and start doing this you live it it's something mm -hmm. that you live all the way through whether it's you know previous traumatic experiences that have happened to you or training in the field and working with people it's not just academic knowledge for you yeah yeah no no totally it's um yeah i mean it's it, for me personally, like I, I have obviously been through uh, a significant amount of trauma myself. Um, you know, so speaking as a woman and having lived that, I was diagnosed with PTSD when I was in my youth. As I mentioned, my my mom, um, my mom was a, a survivor of, of domestic violence. Her, you know, second husband was very abusive to both of us. From you know, for me, it was from the age of seven into fourteen, both um, uh, physically and sexually. Uh, being raped twice as well and, you know, being sexually assaulted, I've had to go through. Um, and all of that has, has really led me to, uh, to really kind of look at my own life and, and, and where I can kind of, kind of go and the opportunities that, that I can make for myself to not only overcome that, but accept them. It's something that we, you, you know, you never, you never get over. It's, it doesn't just leave your life. It's something that you continually have to work at. So, for me, it's been about uh, learning as much as I can about the neuroscience and the biochemical processes that the brain actually goes through. So what areas of my brain actually shut down um, when there's significant trauma, when, you're, when your brain tries to cope? And then, you know, what happens not only, uh, you know, psychologically for me 
And, you know, for me, it's, uh, I'm actually quite an introvert, um, by trade. That's, that's, you know, I've always been kind of the person that does the solo runs and, uh, you know, spends a lot of time in contemplation and pondering life's biggest questions. And so me being social is, is a big part of my support system and getting out there. And from a physical, uh, standpoint, you know, I, I have had to deal with chronic pain most of my life due to the abuse that I had as, as a child. And that is, uh, adhesions and scar tissue and, you know, um, just uh, contractures that sit around my spine that I just have to deal with every day. But it doesn't stop me from pursuing the goals that I have, which are, you know, I, I train officers and I love doing the the, the physical abilities tests with them. Um, I love lifting. You know, I'm I, I love ultra running. These are all things I love to love to do. But the reality is, is that when we think about it, you know, when the body feels vulnerable and kind of out of control, it's not concerned with you know efficiency and effectiveness. You know, it's what it's concerned with is preservation and integrity of the structures and being ready to, to take on the loads that you're trying to impose. So it's really about, you know, your body and your brain going to the survival mechanism. And in order to, uh, to get yourself out of that, you have to, uh, relearn and reframe some of the things that you've gone through. You're never going to forget them. Those are memories, but you can replace those with different coping strategies. And, you know, in, in, uh, you know, in psychology, we call it, we call it positive psychology or cognitive restructuring, but it's really about changing your perception and, and what you place meaning on, um, when those triggers kind of come up. And that, you know, leads, you know, back into the, the, the conversation we had about PTSD and, and also, you know, um, you know, women in general, you know, do 10, you know, one in three women will become the, the victim of, of, uh, abuse. One in three uh, Canadians, and it's actually one in three uh, Americans as well, will will have some kind of mental illness um, at some point in time, in the sense of like being associated with it, and that can be just something as small as depression or mood swings. So it, it's it's we just need to talk more about it. We need to be more open about it and understand that there is an as a, there is a connection between those three spheres of of biological, psychological, and social. One of the Things that I always like to look at is, and and you you mentioned it, which is perfect, is what value do you place on something? How much do you let it affect you, and what do you learn from it? And it's one of the big things I I do in training, and one of the reasons that in Promac we teach the way that we do is so that people don't assign a emotion. They they mm-hmm. get detached from what they're doing, so they can look at it objectively. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, that's uh, that's not right or wrong. You know, it's efficient or inefficient. That you know, it's all about how much value you place on something and what you do with that. And I think a lot of times people let those limitations that they have, they they put they they don't get the full value out of something because they're never able to actually get there all the way without the pain. And mm-hmm. you know, they they never heal up first. You know, you have people that have been in pain for so long, so. One day they decide they're going to start doing something, and then it's not as much about getting the form right to be able to excel. It's about working around the injuries that you have so you never truly get to be able to fully realize the value of what that can do for you, whether it's martial art or whether it's fitness or whatever it may be. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, definitely. It's um, it's an interesting paradigm because, you know, we... Uh, we want to steer away, away from pain as much as we can. Yet at the same time, you know, especially like I've been in martial arts for, for 10 years, um, and it's something I absolutely love. But, you know, even with that, I, I find I, I have to dial it back a little bit because I will push, 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 push. And, you know, succeeding doesn't mean suffering. So, and it's, it's a, it's, it's walking that fine line. Um, yeah, it's, it's an interesting, it's an interesting space to be in. And so every week we do the plug where our guest gets to plug whatever they want. So what do you want to plug, Sarah? Oh, what do I want to plug? Great question. Um, well, um, cool thing happening that's been incubating over the course of the last uh, six months is I'm going to be launching a new business called Movolution. So the website will be up and running uh, with a, within the next week or so. There's going to be a, a lot of good information on there. Um, for the time being, you can find me on Twitter at Movolution which is the, the Twitter handle, that's M-O-V-E-O-L-U-T-I-O-N. And for Run for a Cause, you can find me at the Twitter handle, Sarah M. Jamison. That's S-A-R-A-H-M-J-A-M-I-E-S-O-N. Well, we appreciate you coming on. Um, it's a ton of information. We're definitely going to have you back 
very soon to talk about movement dysfunction and some other questions that I had. And then um, people will be able to submit some questions that they want to have asked so we can make sure that we have those going on. And we just appreciate you coming on and helping everybody do their best to conquer themselves and be better in life. Yeah, thank you for having me. Thank you. Now, that's just a sample of the types of interviews that we're going to have. Like I said, some of it will be back and forth. A lot of it might be just a person talking. I want to piggyback a little bit and have a little audio lecture, which everybody is familiar with, about what I talked to Sarah about. It's an amazing science that she is working through and working with in the field that a lot of us see in the people that come into our classes or into our lives, but we don't quite know how to work with them. Now, most people know that I have dogs, and a lot of people make jokes about my Instagram to say, Matt, um, is it your Instagram or your dog's Instagram? Before I had the dogs that I have now, which is Phoenix and Pat, and I had Audie and Sonny. And Audie and Sonny I got when they were seven weeks old, and they were golden. Best dogs I've ever had in my life. I trained them from the very beginning. And they were only used to my interaction with them and the interactions I controlled with them. When I got Phoenix, she was 14 pounds, laying dead in a ditch, and had a rope grown into her neck. When I got Patton, he was covered in scars. He was completely destroyed and, I mean, had gigantic holes in, in his sides. Both of them were about a year and a half to two years old. Actually, Patton was about nine months and Phoenix was about a year and a half. The reason I talk about this is that there's a difference between the people that we deal with from the very beginning, like a family member or a friend since childhood, and people that come into our lives Later on, we're dealing with damage, the damage that we know and the damage that we don't know, because we constantly process our experiences through our previous experiences. We're driving down the road, looking in the proverbial rearview mirror and to become better teachers and to become better instructors and to become better in general in the relationships in our lives, we have to recognize that and figure out what we're going to do with it in order to become better in how we interact with things. So looking at the models that Sarah talked about, I want to piggyback it a little bit and talk about three things that you can do, whether you have a fitness gym where people show up with previous industry injuries I don't know what industries is. Maybe they've been in a different industry and they're coming to you, um, and which is completely possible if you think about it. If somebody comes from the yoga, body weight, Pilates world and they come into a weight training gym, they might have a different experience. But to look at these things, and here's three things piggybacking the conversation that Sarah and I had that you can do, which is look at the response to your teaching. When you're teaching a new student and they come in, you should always interview them before they ever show up and get an idea of what they've been through, what their previous experiences are, not only in what you're teaching, but in things that they've dealt with in the past. Look at their response to your teaching. Dig in. Ask those questions. Are they a kinesthetic learner? Are they a visual learner? Are they an auditory learner? What kind of learner are they? Work with them. Ask them those questions and look at their response to your teaching. Look at their movement. Correct what they can do, not what you want them to do. And what I mean by that is that people due to previous in injuries or previous training, we talk a lot in previous audio lectures about neurology, people have the ability to do certain things either because they have limitations in their range of motion and previous industry injuries, so industries again, previous injuries, or it's their previous training. 
you can't always have them do exactly what you want them to do. Sometimes you have to adjust a little bit and correct what they are able to do in order to bridge that gap to get them to where they do the things that you want them to do. If you simply look at them and you go, I don't understand why you can't get this. Like, this is easy. This is so simple. Like, how can you not figure this out? Well, you're dealing with somebody that has years, decades, a lifetime of experience before they ever got there. So what is easy to you and the things that you've done and the things that you've been training in is not easy for them. Now, this seems very simple. Matt, I already know that, man. I don't know why you're telling me this. Like, let's talk about fighting. You can't get somebody to fight until you've dealt with the things that they've gone through in the past, like Sarah talked about. If you look at where they are today and you have that patience to be able to get them to where you want them to be and where they want to go because they're training with you, then you're looking at the difference between a very good student that's around for a while and the person that shows up and they have some type of disagreement like we talk about in CLM3, the teacher and the and the student, the, the manual that we have, it's the difference between a short-term student that gets frustrated and leaves or causes a disruption in your class and a long-term student that becomes a good trainer for you and can eventually fill in for classes, or who knows, advance your art where you've never been before. So if we look at the response to your teaching and we look at their movement, then we need to look at the social interaction that they have. How do they work with the group around them? How do they work with the way that people address things to them or direct things to them? How do they react to the training environment in general? If you have somebody come from a school that had a lot of padding and you don't have a lot of padding. If you have warm-ups that include weights and they don't really do weights. If they're used to a group that is very sensei-oriented and traditionally oriented, they're going to, they might have a hard time with your training environment or vice versa. You look at the social interaction. Once you look at their response to your teaching, their movement and their techniques or their methods and the things they are capable of doing, and the social interaction that they have, you can start to get a good idea of what you need to do as a good teacher. And this is why we always base back to the CLM, because the CLM is universal. I developed it with Dr. John Landry. We took years trying to figure all this out. And then he was a great mastermind for figuring out exactly what we needed to do in order to get the best adult education out of it. The best thing that we had to do to teach adults and then with the, that's in the EPL with the DPT, we really simplify the testing process. And then when you get into the teacher and the student, we figure out the psychological reaction people have to training. We figure out the relationship between the teacher and the student in the training environment and the world around them. And then you get a better overall student. When I look at my dogs, a lot of people tell me, and they're barking in the background, you might actually hear it. People tell me, your dogs are so well behaved. You must have had them since they were babies. I don't look at them like that. And I tell people, no, I've had them for a long time. There's a difference between having a dog since it was a baby and the dog that shows up that has had a lot of bad experiences. You have to look at their response to you. You have to look at their movement, their things that they do to voice their attitude or the things that they're thinking or their instincts. And you have to look at their social interaction with the people outside of you as their primary trainer and the environment that you have, if you have dogs that are already there and they have to work within that social structure, it's very similar. But I always bring it back to dogs because, well, I'm single. I don't have any kids and I, I, I love dogs. But if you're a good looking girl that is really intelligent and you're in the Atlanta area, let me let me know. You know, there are a lot of podcasts about martial art, but there are not a lot about conquering ourselves. There are a lot of podcasts with a lot of humor, but there aren't a lot of podcasts where we laugh at ourselves first to become comfortable with who we are 
And then once we become comfortable with who we are and where we are, then we're able to correct those things that we know we need to correct about ourselves. And that's what we really want to do with the new Promec podcast is bring out that science, bring out that idea that it's okay where we are. How can we move forward from there? How can we laugh at ourselves? How can we laugh at other people? How can you laugh at me? To have some fun with this. Now, this podcast will only get better if you get more listeners and you get more people tuning in and you tell your friends about it and get them going on it. The more listens we have, the more downloads we have, the more subscribers we have, the more we're able to go out and get some of those bigger names to come back and talk to us. I know a lot of people, and people that I know know a lot of people. At that rate, we can probably get Kevin Bacon on. Um, The more support that we have for this, the more you're on the Facebook, the more you tell your friends, the more you share our postings and get people involved, the more the bigger names that are out there. And to, to say that the people that we have are small names, that that's a massive, massive understatement. The people that we're bringing on are huge. But I have a lot of people within the Promec instructor group that ask me for names that are very, very, very gigantic names. And the more people we have, the more questions we have, and the more we're able to really dig into our guest and get the most out of them and then get better and better guests. And that is the ultimate goal of this. Another thing that we're going to do is we're constantly going to have our previous guests back on. If we have a lot of questions for them, we're going to bring them back on and we're going to pepper them with those questions and talk about those questions. Really dig in on the questions that people have based off of the previous podcast that they've heard. So if you're really interested in what Sarah had to say tonight, make sure you go over to facebook.com slash podcast, or you can email info at promac.com and ask the questions that you have if you don't want to be on Facebook. And we will take those, talk to Sarah, and we will bring her back. Her and I already talked about it. We missed an entire section on this podcast of things that we wanted to talk about that she's got to come back anyway with her incredible knowledge that we can get those questions to her. Going to go ahead and leave you with A World Away by Shouting at Satellites, one of the best bands I've ever heard, and, well, I should say that because my best friend and sister, Carly Krantz, is their lead singer, her and her husband. They have a great band. Make sure you go by YouTube, check them out, Shouting at Satellites, and if you ever have a couple of spare dollars, pick up their album for digital download, which is Closer to the Home. Closer to Home. Sorry about that, Carly. And... You will not be disappointed. As always, conquer yourself. Think outside the box. Organize and be effective. This is Matt Powell, and I'm out. <laughs>